Hey, good morning. <clears throat> so, where's our pastor? Uh, yeah, right. Um, I was going to thank him publicly for trusting me with his pulpit. Um, I, they got back yesterday from our annual convention in New Orleans, and he suspected they'd have flight troubles, in which they did. And so he had no idea what time he'd get back, and so he asked to make sure I could fill in for him today as well. So I was going to thank him for that and let you guys know who are not uh, regulars here that there's hope. There's someone else coming next week. So. <laughs> All right, Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Uh, last week, uh, in filling in for Pastor John, the message was, it's time to set our debtors free. Today is, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? And it's the vineyard parable. So John, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 20. I want you to, by the way, uh, Pastor John always has all the stuff up here. I, this is all you're going to get. So if you have your scripture, you can follow. If not, just kind of hang with me anyway. So the main passage is uh, Matthew chapter 20. But right before that in chapter 19, there's an incident, actually two parts of an incident that I want to refer you to. And then there's an incident after the parable I want to share with you. So in chapter 19, verse 21, the rich young ruler came up and said to Jesus, you know, what must I do and all this? And Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. So basically, what's in it for me, Lord? What do I have to do to get what you have? What's in it for me? And then if you skip down a few verses, apparently the disciples hear about this or hear this conversation. Verse 27, Peter answered him, Lord, we have left everything to follow you. What then shall there be for us? What's in it for us? We followed you. That rich young guy won't do that, but we've dropped everything. What's in it for us? And then if you skip over to chapter 20, verses 20 and following, you see another kind of thing where what's in it for us, although it's kind of a surrogate request from the mother. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to, to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down before, asked him a favor. What is it you want, he said. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine, and by the way, these John and James, the, the disciples, the apostles, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Basically, Hey, Lord, what's in it for my guys? Can I get them on a front row seat next to you? So we're going to talk about the parable of the vineyard, the parable of the vineyard workers uh, in chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Now, let me kind of give you a rehearsal of it, then we'll read the scripture. So verses 1 through 3, a man who's a boss comes and says to a group of people standing around to work, I need you to work in my vineyard. You come, they negotiated, and he said, I'll pay you a dinar. Basically, the normal day's wage. So that was verses 1 through 3. They came at 6 a.m. for the 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. workday, and he hired them for dinar. Verses 4 and 5. Then the owner came at various times of the day and said to people standing around, I'll hire you if you want to work. Go, and I'll pay you what I'm supposed to pay you. Never says what it is, but they go. Then verses 6 and 7. The, the boss comes at 5 p.m., one hour before the workday is over, and says, why are you standing here? You go work in my vineyard, and I'll pay you. Never says what well to pay them, right? So then, verses 8 through 10, he said they paid them, the owner paid them all the dinar. Every one of them, from 6 a.m. workers to the 5 p.m. workers, got paid the same a dinar. Uh, verses 11 and 12, the 6, or 6 a.m. group grumbled. We worked hard all day, but yet this guy came for an hour, and we get the same thing. Verses 13 through 15, the employer answered the grumbler and said, here's what I'm going to tell you about your grumbling. And then verse 16, the tagline, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. All right. So let's read the parable. Um, but I like to give you the hint of the, what the scripture is about because sometimes when I'm reading, you're kind of trying to catch up and see what's going on. I'm hoping it makes it easier. So here's the actual scripture. For the kingdom of heaven 
is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a dinar for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, about 9 a.m., he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, so around noon and about three o'clock, and did the same thing. About the 11th hour, 5 p.m., he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard asked to, asked, uh, said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going to the first. So bring the 5 p.m. people in and work backwards. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour, 5 p.m., came and each received a, den a dinar. So when those came who were hired in the first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a dinar. When they received it, they began to grumble and ask and against the landlord, these men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But the landowner uh, answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a dinar? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Do not I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first shall be last. So, let me give you the key ideas here in reverse order. And then, by the way, if you were here last week, um, I had eight points. And some of you, I could see you groan and think, oh man, this morning I only have three, right? Three. Now they're much longer, but hey, there's the three. Okay. So here, here are the key ideas. In, you know, come, give me some slack, guys. Chuckle. Last week, I actually had you chuckle a little bit on, on cue. Just relax, okay? Give me, give me some room here, all right? Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so here's, here's the reverse idea. Number one, he said, do not be envious because I'm generous. I have the right to pay what I want to pay, and I want to give everyone a dinar. So don't be envious because I'm generous. All right? Going backwards. Take your pay and go. You agree to a dinar. I'm not being unfair to you. So basically he said to them, don't be envious because I'm being jealous you got what you deserved, all right? I, we negotiated a dinar, you got a dinar. When, um, when I taught on the college level, we would always provide a syllabus for the students. The syllabus was a contract for the semester. Here's what the course is, here's what we're gonna study, here's the amount of reading you have to do, here's the amount of research papers, here's the schedule of quizzes, here's the schedule of major exams. All, it was a contract between the professor and the student. Now, we always had the right to be more generous. We could take the assigned papers and we could shrink them. We could say you need less sources, you need less documentation. We could say we're not gonna have a quiz today, we're gonna forego that quiz. You won't be harmed by it, we're gonna forego it. Maybe you guys are doing so good, I won't even give you a final exam. We could always shrink the syllabus. We could never expand it once the class started. That was a contract. And so this is what the owner was saying. We made a contract, I didn't expand it to make you work more than a day for just a dinar, and I didn't give you less than a dinar, I gave you exactly what was there. So don't be envious because I'm, I'm generous. Take your pay and go. Uh, I'm not being unfair to you. And what's implied is you should be grateful because you didn't have any work. I gave you work, and I didn't take advantage of you. I simply made a contract and you worked. And then he gives a tagline at the very end, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. All right, so I want to give you three takeaways this morning about this passage, just three. Here's number one. Do not fall prey to the work for wage spirit with respect to spiritual matters. Do not fall prey to the work for wage spirit with respect to spiritual matters. 
In chapter 19, verse 16, the rich young man, what things must I do to get eternal life? That's the work for the wage. In 1927, Peter says, we, we have left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? That's work for the wages in the spiritual area. The mother of James and John, and John uh, why don't you do this for my boys? They've worked hard for you. Let them sit there. Work for wage spirit. And then in our parable, it's negotiation and pay. What, what I might call this is transactional religion when it takes place in the church. All right? It's a transaction. So in the parable, the owner goes to the workman in the, at six in the morning and says, here is the transaction we're going to take care of today. I need you to work. I'm going to pay you. The other guy says, okay, I need the work. I'll accept that pay. That's a transaction. That's all it is. I, I buy something from you. You give me the thing. That's a transaction. All right? So transactional stuff, when it goes into religion, comes from a certain point of view. And if it's from a personal point of view, here's what we say when we're transactional within the church with God. If I tithe God, if I give you 10% of my money, you are obligated to bless me financially. It's a transaction. I give you 10%, then you're obligated to just pour out your blessings. If I attend the church enough, then the church is obligated to give me a position, be on a committee, be on something, be on whatever. It's transactional. It's like, if I fill in the blank, then you, God or the church, must do and then fill in the blank. It's transactional. In other words, what's in it for me? If I tithe, what's in it for me? If I attend, what's in it for me? If I do something for you in the church, what's in it for me? That's transactional. That's the first part of what this vineyard guy did. He said, I need this transaction with you. Here's the dinar, come and work for me. The guy says, okay, I'll take the dinar and I'll work for you. It's a transaction. So here's the tra transactional religion from a church point of view. The first one was from a personal point of view. If I do something, you, uh, God, you, or the church have to do something in return. Here's how it works in a church point of view. If you do not obey the religious rules, you'll be punished. That's the transaction. You come to a religious setting. Now, it doesn't happen here, but this is the way it is in religion from the church point of view. If you do not obey the religious rules, you'll be punished. Now, George Perkins over here, our, our bass player, is a good friend of mine, so I can pick on him. When I was growing up, where'd he go? Oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah, okay, there you are. Um, if George had worn slipper sandals or whatever you call those things on Sunday morning, flip-flops, to play in the orchestra, we didn't have a band because that was only allowed on a Sunday night, but an orchestra, if he did that, he would have been punished. The transaction would have been, George, you come and work for us in the church, but if you break the rules on the dress code, you're done. Or, George, you're not done. Yeah. George is one of my, as a, as a church consultant here, I do a lot of supply preaching, and when I'm in a jam, I, he's my number one guy. So I, I love you, George. Yeah. Love your flip-flops. Okay. Transactional religion from a church point of view is also, if you don't believe correctly, you'll be punished. If you don't believe what I believe from the pulpit, you'll be punished. And you think, that doesn't happen. Well, I can tell you that one of our churches, uh, we have about 30 of them in our association that I consult with. One of the churches had a pastor years ago who was so Calvinistic, so predestination, so reformed, whatever word you want to use, if you're not familiar with the church language, it is a belief that God created some people for heaven and some people for hell, and they were bound that way and there's no choice about it. You're born, you're going to hell. You're born, you're going to hell, heaven. It doesn't matter. You, you, there's no way out of the, the situation. All right? The guy believed that was called reformed theology to the very max, 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 like hyper-reformed, all the way over there. The pastor believed that, 
and questioned the church members on it. And if they did not believe like he did, he literally uh, took away their membership and threw them out of the church. That's transactional. You believe like I do, and you'll get the blessing of the church. That's transactional, right? So number one, do not fall prey to the work for wage spirit. Here's number two. Do not fail to recognize God's generosity. Look at chapter 20, verse 9. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a dinar. That was God's generosity. The 5 p.m. group got full pay even though they worked only a small time. All right? You know how we equate that in our church? I was going to say something about the music staff, but I, that's probably a bad joke, so I won't do that. You know, sometimes things pop in your head you, sh- you know you shouldn't say, and then they just kind of trickle out and you think, okay, and then you spend more time explaining what you shouldn't have said, and then people look at you like, just get on with it. Okay. Do not fail to recognize God's generosity. This is not transactional. This is relational. When the landowner went at 5 a.m. and made the contract with those early guys, that was transactional. When he went around at 3 o'clock or 5 o'clock and he said, how come you guys aren't working? Well, we don't, no one's hired us. He said, I'm going to hire you, go and work and then gave them a dinar, gave them the same pay for three hours or one hour that he gave the people. That's relational because what happened was that the man saw the need. If this was just transactional and the men worked one-twelfth of the time, then they should have gotten eight and a half percent of the pay that the first guys got. And if they was hired at three o'clock, they should have gotten 25% of the pay that the first guys got but they got 100% of the pay. It's not transactional, it's relational. And here's what relational Christianity looks like from a personal point of view. We looked at the transactional from a personal point of view, here's the relational from a personal point of view. If you have a need and I can meet that need, I'm going to meet that need. That's relational. If you have a need and I can meet that need, I'm going to help you. Let me give you some illustrations. We have a food bank. We have a bunch of people in here who work in that food bank. It's meeting the need. Last time I heard, that food bank from our church was helping as many as 2,000 people a month. I was in a meeting uh, Wednesday, Thursday morning, I think, and it was a different church, and they... (laughs) They have a food bank sort of in their church, but it's not run by the church. It's run by someone else. And um, the person who was running the food bank, as people were coming in to get their free bread, was saying, the food bank is running low on money. You need to consider making a donation to the food bank. To the people who couldn't afford their bread and they were coming to get the free bread, they were saying, you need to pony up for this. It's like, wow. Wow. We don't have that at our food bank. In fact, what we have at our food bank is massive generosity. And I've come to see it once in a while. We have people who want to pray for the folks. They give opportunity to receive prayer if they want. We have men and women taking the bags or the carts out to the cars to help them load. It's a relationship. I think even one of our folks in here, actually, this is the reason I come to check it out once in a while. They actually bring snacks for the people who come to the food bank so they can get a snack as they're looking at stuff in the food bank. And by the way, uh, I think it was Lois, tell her those brownies were absolutely fabulous and she should do that again. So that's relational. Now that's huge. I can tell you, um, there was a guy in our church who needed a dog kennel. We had a couple of those dog kennels. We buy them at garage sales for 5 or $10. We gave him a dog kennel. I'm not patting myself on the back because five bucks is nothing. But he needed a dog kennel. That's relational. You have a need, we fill it. Many of you have given other people rides to the doctor, rides to church, rides to other places. There was a, there's a guy in the first service 
who loaned his truck to a young man for multiple months because the young man didn't have a vehicle. Kind of irritated me because I needed that truck once in a while and the guy was too generous and gave it to somebody else. There are guys in the first service. I bragged about you guys in the second service. Tom, Dennis, Cecil, Steve. They have done so many things for this church. Not as transactional, but as relational. I was telling the first service, Dennis, who did a lot of my landscaping in my house, um, never took a dime of pay, but you know what he wanted as payment? At 8 o'clock every morning, they, he would work at my house every Thursday morning. At 8 o'clock, when they were ready for a break, he wanted coffee with Swiss Miss. And he came in, sat down at our, our bar, and our not the wet bar, but a countertop, let me, a Baptist countertop. Um, and he wanted conversation. And so we'd sit there and we'd drink coffee and we'd have conversation. That's what he wanted. That's relational. Cecil, some of you know, first service, is a ele retired electrician. He had helped me with a couple things at my house and we gave him and his wife gift cards. I gave one to him for helping me, one to her for letting him go. <laughs> and the guy was actually a little bit irritated. You know what he told me? He didn't use these words, but here's what he was saying. This is relational. It's not transactional. That's the kind of church we have. That's relational Christianity from a personal point of view. But what about from a church point of view? How does that work in the church perspective? I have a book uh, in my library, and I want to read just a small section to you. Uh, there's a section, and uh, some research was done in the book, uh, quoting a guy named Josh Packard, who studied people leave the church. Why do people leave the church? And he, he uh, posits the idea that there are 30 million Christians like this who have left the church. And uh, he said, these once pillars of the church and core personnel wanted community but received judgment. And these are leaders in the church. They wanted meaningful activity but saw only bureaucracy. They craved conversation but only heard doctrine. They desired to engage in meaningful ministries yet heard only moral prescriptions. Translation, they wanted community, relational, but all they got was judgment, transactional. They wanted meaningful activity, relationships, but got only bureaucracy in the church, transactional. They craved conversation, relational, but heard only doctrine, transactional. They desired to engage in meaningful ministries, relational, but heard only moral prescriptions, transactional. Studies show that when these people come into the church and when new people come into the church and do not have relational experiences with one another, they don't gain a friend, they don't get to know somebody, that almost every one of these folks is gone within seven weeks from that church when there's no relational. Folks, we cannot be transactional in our ministry in our church. It is not a, you do this for me and we will do this for you. It has to be relational. So number one, do not fall prey to the work for wages spirit in spiritual matters. Number two, do not fail to recognize God's, uh, God's generosity. Number three, be far removed from envy. Verses 14 and 15 say this. Oops. Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Do not I have the right to do what I want with my money or are you envious because I'm generous? Here's the truth. I'm okay with what I get until I see what you got. After we came back from the Middle East the first time, we were asked to go to a small church that had about five couples in it, asked to help them kind of survive and figure out what they're going to do and get them ready for a new pastor and asked us to go there for five or six months while we were on furlough from the International Mission Board. And um, eight years later, we left. <laughs> it's like, ooh, that was a long five months. 
Um, they didn't have a budget, so we want to get a budget so we can actually do something, uh, you know, do things the right way. And uh, small church, we, we, and I can't remember the numbers exactly, but these are pretty similar. We gave the children's uh, area $800 for the year. Doesn't sound like a lot, but I mean, it was a tiny church. And they were, they were woo, woo, look at that, we got $800 to spend. Then we gave the teens $1,200 because stuff for teens is a lot more expensive. They were like, woo, look what we have. And then when the children's department realized what the teens got, 800 versus 1,200, all you know what broke loose because it wasn't fair. They were envious. I'm okay with what I get until I see what you get. Now, I told the early morning group, first service, I may or may not use this next illustration because my wife is in here and I didn't want to say this out loud. But when I went to pick her up after the first service, she kind of slipped and said she saw the sermon online for service. So, and she's still talking to me, so I'm okay. Okay, be far removed from envy. You've heard me talk about my house, especially my backyard. I love my garden area, my swing, and I love to go out there and just watch the plants and the little trees and stuff. And I have these little baby palm trees, and I just, I love, I just love my house. I, in fact, when I saw it online four and a half years ago when I was interviewing for my current job, I was like, I got this house on the brain. And then uh, several months later, we showed up in Kingman. I got the position with the association, and that house was still in the market, and we bought it. Um, I, I've loved that house from the very beginning, right? And, and I'm not a rich man, and um, I'll just tell you what I told the first congregation. Um, if you count the price of the house and the need of repairs, it was 190000 190. So it's not an expensive house. So I'm not a rich man. I've loved that house. I still love that house. Last month, our oldest son bought his first home. It's in California. He's a financial planner at a boutique firm. And when he sent us the link to the house, I about fell over. It is amazing. A million dollars, basically, including the beautiful pool out back. I became so jealous, it wasn't funny. Up until the moment prior to seeing that link to his new house, I loved my house. I'm being serious. And then I saw that, and boy, the envy just set in. Now, I'm back to loving my house. I'm kind of over it for the most part. <laughs> I, you know, I was like, I said to myself, grumbling, son, I, we paid for half your tuition. <laughs> son, we got you new car, not new, we got you used cars. Son, I put those clothes on your back, you know. That's what envy does. These guys who are paid a dinar for their day's work got what they negotiated. And they were angry because the landowner blessed someone else more than he blessed them. I'll tell you one more. You're going to go to Pastor John and say, man, you guys, you need to get this guy some emotional help. <laughs> my, my mom was one of the most generous people I've ever met. She gave us all kinds of stuff, including trips to Israel and all kinds of stuff. There was always something that she was blessing us with. And I, I always thought she was the best thing and then one day I realized, out of the four siblings, I was the only one, Sue and I were the only ones, that she did not take on at least one cruise. All the other siblings, she treated to cruises. At least one, and sometimes more. And I was like, razzle, frazzle, razzle, frazzle. I had forgotten that my mother took my sister, I mean my wife, to Jamaica, I'd forgotten that my wife had sent me on a trip and uh, invited Sue to go to Israel. Um, I'd temporarily forgotten all the things my mother had blessed me with, but when I did the comparison of that she never took us on a cruise, I gritted my teeth. Be far removed from envy. So here's what the scripture says, and I'll wrap this up. Don't fall prey to work for wages spirit. Don't fail to recognize God's generosity. 
be far removed from envy. It's all about relationship rather than transaction. And God wants a relationship with us. He does not want a transaction with us. He wants a relationship. And that relationship involves His generosity. And that relationship should not include our envy. Because what God has done for us in saving us when we put our faith in Him, you know, He allowed Christ who knew no sin to become sin for us and die in our place that we might become the righteousness of Christ. That's what God did for us. That's relationship. Like the vineyard worker going out at five o'clock and having mercy on the guy who had no money for the day. This is what God did for us. He saw us in our need and gave his son for us. The relationship was there. All we had to do was say yes to Jesus, confess our sin, become a child of God, and live for him. There was no, if you give enough money, you get your passport stamped. If you come to enough meetings, you get your passport stamped. If you do enough activity, you get your passport stamped. It was, I gave you my son to die in your place. I'm asking you to receive him and be part of my family. That's relational. That's what the vineyard worker was doing. He was saying, I see you have no food because most of these guys wouldn't have had anything to eat that day if they didn't make that dinar. He saw their need and said, here's what I want. Come and work for me and I'll give you something and gave him full pay for the day even though they worked one hour or three hours or six hours. God wants a relationship with you. But there's a second thing that God wants. He wants a relationship between all of us. What God did for us in relationship, he wants us to treat each other the same way. He wants that relationship so that it's not transactional between us, it's relationship. This parable tells us so much differently than what other religions tell us or what other thought groups say. Because it's usually, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. It's not that way. It is God did something for us, though we didn't have any part in it, and God expects us to help one another and be part of other people's lives, even though they don't deserve it, maybe they never asked for it, but he wants us to be relational. It goes from God to us, and then us to others. The parable of the vineyard worker. The blessing comes to those no matter the circumstance. That's what God wants from us. Perhaps you've never come to know Christ. This is the day in which religion moves from transactional to relational. Instead of you thinking, I've got to go to the church so I can be saved, you've now come to a place where it's relational and you say, I know that Jesus Christ died for my sin and I want to be a part of God's family. That's relational. And if that's not the good news, I don't know what is. It's good news that Jesus died for us and allowed us into his family. All right, let's pray. Father, I pray first of all for those who have never come to know you as Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that that one or those two or those three today would understand what your scripture says and understand what your son did for us. Father, thank you that Christ died on the cross for our sin and opened the way for us to have that relationship with you. So, Father, I pray for those who have never come to know Christ, that your Holy Spirit would prompt them to say yes to Jesus today and begin that relationship. And, Father, I pray for the rest of us that we'll make sure that we don't do transactional Christianity, but we do relational Christianity, where we care for one another. We do what's best for one another. We care for one another like you cared for us. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for your scripture which guides us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who teaches us and brings to mind what you want us to know. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. May you be blessed and may your will be done in our church. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, one more piece of good news. Pastor John is back with us next Sunday. Woohoo! All right, thank you. Good morning and God bless you.